for coming. This is a really exciting event to get to share with you all and celebrate with the participants here that you see as our panelists. This is our second virtual demo day and it has been a really interesting experience transitioning that in-person event to this virtual environment and we really enjoyed how that was able to transform last cohort when they did it in a relatively short amount of time and this cohort that you'll see graduating here today has done their entire training experience virtually so in addition to all of the technical and professional development content that they have learned and masters mastered over the last 14 weeks they have also done so with the challenges that we're all facing working virtually and learning how to make that work so those are additional skills and experience that they bring to the table so happy to share that with you today we are excited to show you the projects that the students have worked on today not only because it's demonstrating the technical skills that they've learned and some really interesting problems that they've worked on solving, but also because it demonstrates some of our partnerships that Innovate Birmingham has built out and has continued to deepen over the last several years. We have a number of those partners represented here today as judges or guests, and this is just a small fraction of the large community of partners that Innovate Birmingham is thankful to have to make us do what we do successfully and have that impact that we have on the community. If you are not already familiar with Innovate Birmingham, I'll share with you a little bit about how we got here, what we're doing, and what you can expect to see from us in the future. My name is Haley Medved Kendrick. I'm the Executive Director of Innovate Birmingham, and it has been my pleasure to serve in that role for the last few years really building these partnerships within the community toward a shared vision of equitable economic prosperity for our tech ecosystem. What we do to reach that vision is work with local talent and local employers to connect the dots between people who have and are learning these skills to provide value in software development and data analytics and other tech careers and our local companies here that need that talent to fill the jobs that they're looking to fill and add efficiency and effectiveness on their teams and make Birmingham and our region a more competitive economic region and successful. We have trained over 700 folks in the last three and a half years and this is our newest class of students who will be entering the job market and have a fresh new crop of data analytics and software development skills, which you will see here today. In light of the virtual environment, something that we added with our last demo day was the addition of judges to provide feedback to our students and their presentations, really focusing on their ability to, to communicate those technical skills that they have learned and the effectiveness of that communication in this forum. So I'm very excited to have the five guest judges that we have today. Each of these guests have been wonderful partners of Innovate Birmingham, and I will share a tiny snippet about each of them, uh, but know that it would take the entire meeting to share all the excellent work that they have done in their careers. First, we have Delphine Carter. Delphine is the CEO and founder of Bulo Solutions, and Delphine has spent her career working in product management and technology companies large and small, really going from growing and really scaling businesses and has now put that experience to work in talent development, specifically focused on bridging the gap between professional and personal life with her work at Bula Solutions. Thank you, Delphine, for being here with us today. Next, we have Elijah Davis, who is the Strategic Growth Manager at Urban Impact, which is a community economic development agency that services the Birmingham Civil Rights District and the historic Fourth Avenue Business District. Elijah has worked with a portfolio of small businesses in the community to provide creative solutions and partnerships to solve problems and has been a ongoing partner of Innovate Birmingham, working to connect talent that can solve these problems with technical solutions and the small businesses that can benefit from those solutions. So thank you, Elijah, for being here today. Next, we have Michael Landis, who is Enterprise Account Executive with Google. And Michael has spent his career working from all types of companies to large enterprises, startups, small and medium-sized businesses, 
government and education institutions, including where he is now at Google and Amazon and many other companies, including Hughes Network Systems. He's passionate about using technology and data to solve problems and enabling a, a diverse and equitable generation of technologists coming up in the future. So thank you, Michael, for being here with us today. Next, we have Dr. Adrian Starks, who is the founder and CEO of Stream Innovations. Dr. Starks launched Stream Innovations in 2015 in Birmingham and has driven toward a mission that is committed to supporting students explore a passion for science, technology, reading, engineering, arts, and math, or STREAM. And she does this by providing exposure and experience and engagement opportunities for these students to prepare for their success. success. Uh, Dr. Starks is a native of Birmingham area in Fairfield, Alabama, and received her bachelor's from the Alabama Agricultural and Mechanical University and her PhD in biological sciences from the University of Maryland at Baltimore County. And she completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the National Cancer Institute and was selected as a AAAS If Then Ambassador, which is an initiative focused on exposing girls to and women to STEM programming. We're really fortunate to have Dr. Starks in our community and she is continuing to be recognized for her leadership. So thank you, Dr. Starks, for being here. And finally, we have Emily Jerkins, who is the Director of Research at the Birmingham Business Alliance. Emily has spent her career building strategic research programs at Birmingham Business Alliance and has been a strong collaborator with the community, including with Innovate Birmingham, providing us with really valuable workforce uh, data to inform all of our programming. And over her time with BBA, she has serviced over a thousand research requests and continues to have value to our community by churning out this data that is so critical for us to understand the problems that we need to solve. And she has also co-founded BHAM BizHub, which you'll hear a little bit more about today, which is a resource navigator for entrepreneurs and is working with a team to launch the next release later this year. We uh, thank you so much, Emily, for being here as well. So, we will hear more from our judges a little later in the program, but first I want to introduce to you one of our excellent partners that has really made the last year and a half of Innovate Birmingham possible. We heard from our employer partners about two years ago that data analytics was a in-demand career field, that we needed more entry-level folks coming in with these skills to understand, collect, manipulate, and visualize data. And as we were looking for a solution to that, we were pointed to Robin Hunt. And she has been a wonderful resource for Innovate Birmingham over the last two and a half years, bringing over a decade of experience in teaching data analytics and all types of uh, data skills to all types of folks along their career pathway. And she was able to create programming specifically for our needs at Innovate Birmingham and has now trained dozens of data analysts that have entered the local job market. Robin will share a little bit more with you about what the students have been working on over the last 14 weeks and pass it off to the students. So with that, I'll pass it off to Robin. Thank you. All right, so we do have failover plans um, in case we have any issues. So if we run into any of that, I do ask that you be patient with us as we transition. I really love this program because every career needs a beginning. And sometimes it's the middle and the new beginning for some of our participants. Typically people wanna know what a data analyst is and they're really looking for a single sentence answer something really catchy, but it is almost impossible to define what data analysis actually is. Of course, it's a lot of different things, but it's also the companies and how they define it, which will determine what a data analyst will do at any given time. When I think about it, I really appreciate the data worker definition uh, provided by the European Market Study, which is workers who collect, store, manage, and analyze data as their primary activity or a relevant part of their activity. I think that pretty much nails it for what we're trying to teach here. 
at the end of the day, an analyst gathers data, cleans data, cleans data, cleans data, and then visualizes data. And then also this should be here is the storytelling component, which you'll see today. In previous cohorts, I would say instructor led uh, in person instruction. Of course, today I have to say it's now in a virtual environment and the students get high level overviews before they deep dive into other areas. And one word they've heard or one phrase they've heard a lot over the last few uh, weeks as we've been together is you're muted. A lot of this is directed self-study with LinkedIn learning content and we'll show you some visuals of what they actually have going on in their brains over these 14 weeks. Of course the directed self-study used to occur here in the Innovation Depot as a part of Innovate Birmingham but now it looks a little bit more like this. What you see now on the screen is actually one of the students' breakdown of courses that they consumed over the 14 week period. I think it's fascinating to look at this pie chart. Of course, there's no numbers here because it's way too much content. This and again is with the self-learning component, the, the actual instructor-led component, challenges and group work and all of that mixed together. They're putting a lot in uh, when they come into the boot camp. This is the time wheels of everybody who is still with us today. We started with a few more than what we end with today, but I'm pretty excited about this group. As we move on, I would like to take just a moment to thank our Birmingham Business Alliance and um, the Birmingham Biz Hub. Um, obviously, Urban Impact uh, is an important partnership here with us in the data class. Uh, my team at Think Data for supporting us in everything we do here. I would like to thank Michael Shattuck at the Birmingham, uh, or City of Birmingham, and also Ed Fields for their support. And then of course, BB Ham and HECA all participated in the background of these projects, reviewing everything that we put out, discussing the questions and, and providing feedback for us so that we could create quality products, which we'll see today. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and transition over to the student uh, presentation. So I'll go ahead and ask that my COVID team get prepared, get your breath, because I know you are ready. I know they're looking forward to sharing their results with you, and I know all groups agree that they really need more time than what they get in demo day, but we're gonna be sensitive to that as well. I look forward to them presenting their findings, but just understand with this group, as all the others there are barely scratching the surface of what they could do with this data. I don't want to steal any more of their moments. So Team COVID, you can step up and it's your turn. Take it away. Thank you, Robin. COVID-19 has impacted each of us. That much we know for sure. What we weren't sure of was the effect that it had on small businesses. That prompted us to create the COVID-19 Business Impact Survey. My team and I are excited to show you what we found. Good afternoon, my name is Mary Nelms. My teammates are Mitchell Stooksbury, Jordan Allen, Andrew Wood, and Hunter Rhodes. We will be presenting a series of PowerPoint slides that contain snapshots of dashboards we authored from scratch in Power BI, which is a business intelligence software application that primarily facilitates the creation of interactive dashboards like the one you see on your screen. These dashboards make it easier to investigate data and discover key insights. Utilizing Power BI to clean and analyze our, sur our survey data was the culmination of every skill that we've learned since this cohort began back on May 4th. So that we can showcase Power BI's capabilities, we've integrated animated GIFs into our presentation. These GIFs will show you how Power BI's interactive filters can be applied to our dashboards. Virtually every single thing that you will see on the following dashboards is updated in real time as new data is loaded. We'll do our very best to show you just how intuitive these dashboards can be. So before we do that, I wanna talk briefly about methodology. The survey was completed strictly online and is between 25 and 34 questions long, depending upon how the questions are answered. Only those respondents who said that they were business owners or authorized representatives of a business could complete the survey. Before composing the survey, we researched which questions would offer the most value. To avoid survey fatigue, we were especially selective in the questions asked. We decided on four main categories of questions. 
demographics and business info questions, small business pulse survey questions from the US Census Bureau, COVID-19 impact questions, and finally, questions about government. Now, I will turn it over to Mitchell Stooksbury, who will talk about the results of the first five questions of our survey. Thank you, Mary. Again, my name is Mitchell Stooksbury. I'm going to show you our survey stats and demographics. In the top left corner, you'll see that we had 72 completed surveys. We defined completed surveys by those who answered the last question and clicked done. We also had 83 valid responses. We defined valid responses as those who answered the first two questions. It is a comprehensive survey and we are pleased that 87% of the people who get into it go on to complete it. Just to the right of that, there is a donut chart representing gender. This shows a nearly even split between women and men who took the survey. Moving over to the right, we have an education column chart. According to the US Census, approximately 32% of the general population has a bachelor's degree or higher, while according to Kaufman research, approximately 51% of business owners have a bachelor's degree or higher. 65% of our respondents had a bachelor's degree or higher, thus our survey is skewed toward more highly educated business owners. In the top right corner, there's a zip code map of Alabama. Unsurprisingly, all of our Alabama respondents are from the greater Birmingham area. There's a heat map on the bottom right. As you can see, there was a good reach all over the US. We had response from 11 different states, but a strong concentration on the East Coast. 60% of our respondents were from Alabama, while we had one response from Poland. Race, race and ethnicity is represented in the bar chart on the bottom left. When it comes to race, 82% of our respondents were white. Unlike our other surveys, we have very little minority data. Next up is Mary, who will talk to you about how this survey compares to the Small Business Pulse survey. Thanks, Mitchell. As Mitchell said, I'll be discussing the similarities and differences between the data that we collected and that of the Census's Small Business Pulse survey. Our survey was structured to include questions almost verbatim from the Pulse survey that the US Census Bureau administered to small business owners. The Pulse survey was offered over a nine week period from April 26th through June 27th with results published weekly. Our survey on the other hand was offered over an 18 day period from July 24th through August 11th. We'll be performing our comparisons based on the Pulse data from the week of June 21st through the 27th, the ninth and final week that the Pulse survey was administered. There's a significant difference in time frame here between when both surveys were administered, which is a variable that we'll be accounting for in our analysis. A few more details to note, the poll survey was targeted via email and was confidential, while our survey was targeted via social media and was strictly anonymous. In order to encourage honesty, anonymity was very important to us. We wanted to be able to perform direct comparisons of our data to corresponding pulse data on the national and state levels. That overlap included the outlook-based questions and survival-based questions you see here on the left. When we went through and did direct comparisons one by one between the two surveys, it was blatantly clear that our respondents reported a shift towards stronger feelings, primarily negative impact, and taking more steps to try and help their businesses survive. We theorize that this disparity arises from the two month span between when the two surveys were administered. So from first glance, this chart seems fairly simple, but it was without a doubt the most difficult thing I've done all cohort. A lot of background work went into importing the data from the census, restructuring it to fit our model, and then getting it all into the same chart for comparison. I could make eight or nine more charts almost identical to this one, showing the answers to the rest of our questions that overlap the poll survey, but I don't want to bog you down with a ton of charts, and this one does a really great job of telling the story. This chart asks a question about the overall impact of COVID-19 on the respondent's business. Ultimately, our survey data reflects a far more pessimistic outlook from respondents than the poll survey from the US Census. We believe this is primarily because the IB survey was offered two months later than the poll survey. You can see from the graphic that the winners and losers have been made. Our survey indicated a much more pronounced effect at the endpoints. The negative effect has grown significantly, and there's also an increase in the large positive effect, while neutral opinions have gotten much smaller as people have made up their minds about how the pandemic is really impacting them. The scope of the coronavirus is now better understood than it was in late April, and even in June when the last sur poll survey was conducted. Initially, it was billed as a minor nuisance that many medical experts predicted, predicted to be over by summer. So since the spring, there's been an entire paradigm shift regarding COVID-19. 
A few months ago, the goal was to isolate for 15 days to flatten the curve. And now there's a general expectation that semi lockdowns will be a thing until we have a, fa a vaccine, which could take another 18, 24 months to go through the trials and whatnot. So what it comes down to is that there's a new normal in all areas of life, particularly in demand for many business goods and services. As a result, it's not surprising that the adversity business owners have faced has increased, while at the same time, their forward-looking perspective has changed for the worse. Really quickly, I just wanted to mention, we asked our respondents whether they applied for and received government aid, and if so, which types? While our data parallels the Pulse data in this instance, we think it's important to note that 83% of our respondents who said they applied for government aid reported receiving it. This is really good because the coronavirus relief package from the federal government authorized nearly $4 trillion for the programs noted at the bottom of this visual, like PPP, EIDL, and SBA loan forgiveness, among others. So we're really happy to see that people are mostly getting the federal relief that they need. In addition to the questions that overlap the poll survey, we also included some deep, meaningful questions of our own to take a closer look at how businesses are truly being impacted by COVID-19. Jordan Allen will be taking us through the results of those questions. Thank you, Mary. Hi, my name is Jordan Allen. I'm gonna be taking you through a deeper dive into some of the dashboards and showing you some insights that we've gained from the survey questions our group came up with. Starting on the top left corner, we have a bar chart showing some ways businesses have been affected by COVID-19, like carefully spending, consumer demand decrease, and order and event cancellations. Moving over to the top right, we have another bar chart showing what businesses business owners would do to compensate for lack of operating income, personal savings, business savings, and operating relief. Uh, government relief seem to be the way most business owners would keep their businesses afloat. Moving down to the bottom right, you can find a funnel chart that's showing the impact that mass requirements have had on businesses. Now take a look at the three circular donuts on, on this dashboard. These charts not only represent data, but they also act as interactive filters. The most useful of these turn out to be the donut chart on the left called Move Services Online. It addresses whether business owners decide to move their goods and services online during the pandemic or whether their business already had an online presence. This chart showed us the most interesting information. This slide is a GIF showing the filters on the visuals being applied. This was one of our favorite ways to break down the data and come up with a unique perspective. Here are the three coolest things we found out about this information. And as you'll see, it's mostly a story of e-commerce. Of the businesses that closed, 75% of them did not or could not move their goods and services online. Of the businesses that were able to move their goods and services online, only 25% of them had to close. No, no business whose goods and services were already online had their business closed. Now we'll move on to modification, bis modifications business made to comply with COVID-19 guidelines. In the middle of this page is a donut chart that shows that most businesses we surveyed made COVID-19 related modifications. In the upper right hand corner of this page is a tree map. The size represents, uh, the size of the rectangles represents the number of business owners in each category. Each block shows the amount of money that business, businesses spent on modifications. More than a fifth of the small businesses we surveyed said they spent $1,000 or more on these modifications. On the top left is a bar chart showing the most common types of modifications these businesses made in the physical location. The most common modifications, regardless of the amount spent, were masks for employees, hand sanitizer stations, disinfectant and dis disinfectant supplies. Finally, on the bottom of this page is a visual chart, a visual titled Other Modifications. This is a multi-card visual that is disguised as a text box. The text here comes directly from an open-ended survey response and updates automatically when a new entry is loaded. Next, Andrew will be sharing some insight about COVID-19 impact by location, as well as taking us through some of the, our survey respondent, respondents' opinions about government. Thank you, Jordan. Again, my name is Andrew Wood, and the first thing that I'll be talking about is one of the more interesting takeaways we derived from our data. That is COVID-19's impact by location. Here we have two alternating maps placed directly on top of each other. These maps show negative and positive impacts of COVID-19. They're both filtered by respondents from Greater Birmingham only, and the blue areas on the map are filled in by zip codes. Something here that is immediately noticeable. 
Nearly all the businesses who reported that they were experiencing a positive impact due to COVID-19 were away from downtown Birmingham. These areas are mostly very far out suburbs. This is US 280 outside the I-459 Outer Loop, Greystone, Inverness, all the way to Chelsea, the trustful area in the northeast, northeast of the city, I-65 south of Pelham into southern Shelby County, Calera, Alabaster, Columbiana, etc. The other thing that jumps out is the fact that not a single business that we surveyed in the downtown area and very few in the inner ring suburbs reported positive impact due to COVID-19. We theorized this is because remote work from home is having the strongest economic impact in places where people once had the longest commutes. Simply, businesses located near workers have always done well. The new location of the workers is probably what is driving this discrepancy. Another thing we set out to investigate was how business owners feel about their government when it comes to COVID-19, as well as their overall satisfaction with government. What we found was that these things are highly correlated. That is, people's opinions about government did not have much variance, whether talking about trusting COVID-19 reporting, agreement with government interventions, or satisfaction with the government in general. In all areas, there was a strong preference toward local government, followed by state government, then federal government. Local government was the only level to score on the positive side, that is to have a weighted average above three on a five-point Likert scale. This chart is a sunburst with interactive filters by education and gender. The filter on gender also serves as a donut chart, and this is trusting COVID-19 reporting at all three levels of government. As you can see by the slicing of this chart, there were some interesting things worth noting. Among those with a bachelor's degree, women strongly distrust the federal government's reporting on COVID-19 more than men by a significant margin of 69% to 31%. Interestingly, if you add a bit more education, so among those with a postgraduate degree, men and women are equally distrusting. 56% of all respondents distrust all three levels of government, while only a quarter of all respondents trust all three levels of government. Overall, our respondents distrusted the federal government nine times greater than they did their local government when it came to COVID-19 reporting. Now I will discuss the biggest limitations of this survey. Our biggest limitation was the lack of total responses. Overall, there were only 83 valid responses and 72 completed surveys. Some of the job industries we asked about had zero responses. Furthermore, any confidence intervals or percentile-based calculations on the weighted average of the Likert scale questions were not especially valuable. Statistically, we are not confident that we can make any sweeping conclusions, but we do feel our analysis is useful, and if one wanted to investigate further, our results provide great direction to go about that in a few different areas. The lack of minority data is especially problematic, given that we know from many other sources that COVID-19 has impacted minorities harder than it has non-minorities. That is something that we were unfortunately not able to verify. Education was skewed toward the highly educated. As Mitchell noted earlier, nearly five-sixths of our respondents were white, and nearly two-thirds of our respondents had a four-year degree or higher. This almost certainly gave us a biased perspective. Finally, the lack of an open-ended question at the end. We received valuable and interesting responses from all our open-ended questions, and we wish that we have asked one more at the end of our survey to find out anything miscellaneous our respondents wish to tell us. That is an oversight that we regret. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. If time permitted, we would have loved to have shared all of our interesting findings with you. This project involved myriad intricacies and unforeseen challenges, but we are proud of the work we accomplished. Our hope is that you can walk away from today with a new perspective. Speaking of a new perspective, the Consumer Spending Group will be presenting next by both the 42 respondents who were disqualified from our survey by answering no on question one, and by the 72 who completed our entire survey, we sent 114 survey takers to the consumer spending survey. We do not know how many of them went on to complete it, but we are excited to see their results. Thank you. Excellent, thank you guys. They have worked so hard on these presentations and uh, it was fantastic. You can catch your breath. Just want to make sure we're, we're not going to have any questions until the last of the presentations. Is that correct? Okay. So go ahead, Spending Trends, get yourself prepared. This team really found some amazing insights on spending. Again, there's so much more here than what we have time to present. But part of the process of becoming a data analyst is being able to present this information in short amount of time where people can digest it and work with it. This team worked really hard to measure where we spend our money, what we're thinking about when we spend our money, in a time when supporting women and minority-owned businesses is so important. I look forward to seeing their findings. So you guys, take it away. Thank you, Robin, for that introduction. Hello everyone, I'm Lindsay and on behalf of my spending teammates, Charissa, Andrea, Hassan, and Shane, 
I'd like to thank you for joining us as we discuss our findings on consumer trend spending trends. Our group compiled a 20 question survey asking about consumer spending preferences. The survey went live online three weeks ago, distributed amongst businesses, social media contacts, friends, and family. Using Excel and Power BI, we cleaned and refined our data in order to identify consumer spending trends, particularly as they relate to women and minority businesses. So let's get started. I'll now pass it on to Teresa so she can provide some information on our respondents' demographics. Teresa, you're muted. I'm sorry. Hello. Thank you, Lindsay. Hello, my name is Teresa Chandler. Spending is an integral part of life. 256 people told us why. So, we analyzed spending trends of consumers towards women and minority businesses. The above slide demonstrates the breakdown of our respondents' race and ethnicity. White or Caucasian represents approximately 67%. Black or African American represents approximately 27%. Other races and ethnicities represent approximately 5%. Females make up the majority of our respondents at approximately 69%, with the males approximately 31%. Looking from left to right at the male and female ages, 25 to 34 age group makes up the majority. Of those, approximately 60% are female and 36% are male. We ask, which factors the most important to you when deciding where to spend? We found that both genders, male and female, favored low cost, while rank accessibility least important. So, what do you consciously think about where and how you spend your money? Now I turn it over to Andrea. Lisa. Hello, my name is Andrea Allen. During a pandemic, we're all thinking about how much money we have, but are we thinking about where our money is going? Our survey captured spending trends towards women and minority-owned businesses. For clarity, you will see women and minority-owned businesses refer referenced throughout our data as WMOB. Our main objective was to determine who supports women and minority-owned businesses. Our survey asked, do you make a conscious effort to support all types of women and minority-owned businesses? Respondents chose yes, no, prefer not to answer, and other, please specify. Here's that question broken down by race and gender. We focus on responses from black and white people as there was not a significant response from other races and ethnicities. We had fewer black respondents versus white respondents and more females than males. It was our assumption that black females would represent the majority of respondents who answer yes, they make an effort to support, despite majority of total respondents being white and female. The card on the left of your screen shows we received 107 yes responses. The pie chart to the lower left demonstrates that of those yes responses, females made up approximately 76%. On the chart labeled race, yes responses are represented in blue. White people are split 50-50, while more than 70% of Black respondents support women and minority-owned businesses versus approximately 20% who do not. Upon breaking down our subgroups, we find that our assumption was correct. Approximately 79% of Black females make up majority of respondents who make an effort to support women and minority-owned businesses. However, we think it's important to note that Black men at 76% and white women at 60% answer yes to supporting women and minority owned businesses and should be considered when considering your target audience. We know that relationships are the lifeblood of your business, but are you clear on which relationships make, matter the most to the bottom line? Our survey also asks, 
do you know women and minority owned business owners? Respondents chose, yes, I am the owner. Yes, relatives, associates, or friends. No or unsure. Approximately 52% of respondents stated, yes, they had relatives, associates, or friends who were owners. Of those who answered yes, they make an effort to support. 54% stated yes, they have relatives, associates, and friends that are owners, while 58% who do not make an effort to support that they had relatives, associates, and friends that are owners. This finding got tricky. If I remove business owners from the calculation, the data changed to show that approximately 70% do support relatives, associates, or friends who are owners. That's something to explore further. So why does this matter to you? As an owner, it's crucial to know your audience. Black females support women and minority-owned businesses more than any other group, so you might want to keep them at the top of your email list. White females aren't to be overlooked either. 60% noted they make an effort to support. And while you may love your family and friends, I wouldn't count solely on them for support, especially if they own a business. Thank you so much for your time. I will now turn it over to Lindsay Morris. Thanks, Andrea. My name is Lindsay Morris. Similar to Andrea's findings you just heard, I too is interested in how our survey respondents prioritized a business's ownership when deciding where they would shop. More specifically, which age group would be most likely to support a woman or minority owned business? In our survey, we asked the question, do you make a conscious effort to support all types of women in minority owned business? My goal was to determine if age was indeed a factor in these decisions. Initially, I believe that our younger respondents would be more likely than our older respondents to make an effort to support women in minority owned business. Thanks to the changing demographics of younger generations and perhaps due to recent events impacting American culture, I was curious to find out if my theory could be supported. In order to better visualize our findings, I combined the seven age groups as divided on our survey into three more broad age ranges, ages 18 to 34 in green, 35 to 54 in blue, and 55 and older in yellow. For this question, we had 254 total respondents and the majority of our survey takers fell into the age 18 to 34 group. As you can see from our data, my hypothesis was supported amongst those who took our survey. Our results at the top of the slide show that 55% of younger consumers in light green make an effort to support minority owned businesses, while only 16% of those older than 55 say they support as well. The next three rows represent those who answered no, prefer not to answer, or were unsure. You can see amongst those age ranges, the responses were somewhat similar, with each group making up a little more or less than one third of the total responses. Next, we asked our respondents the question, which types of ownership matter when you decide where to spend? The following options listed here were available, from which they could choose all that applied to them or enter their own response. There were some self-reported outliers like concern for COVID safety precautions and one who claimed any display of women or minority ownership would be a red flag for him not to shop there. For the most part, our data shows that across all age groups, our respondents will support locally owned businesses over all other types of ownership, as you can see in the yellow segments of these charts. Amongst our two younger groups on the left, respondents share similar opinions about which businesses they choose to support with the red minority owned business segment achieving a slight edge over the light green women owned business. In our age 55 plus group on the right though, 41% of those respondents in the light blue say they are not concerned with supporting any specific business owners. So what does this mean to business owners? It depends on which audience they are appealing to. Our data suggests it's always a safe bet to promote a locally owned business as just that. Locally owned businesses are supported amongst all ages. Older shoppers generally do not consider a business's ownership, especially for women or minority owned business. Finally, younger shoppers are responsive to learning about a business's owners and are more likely to go out of their way to support them. Thanks for your time. And with that, I will pass it on to Hassan. Thanks, Lindsay. Hello, hello everyone. My name is Hassan and I'm going to be diving deeper into the work that are most important to you when shopping. The response options were accessibility, convenience, latest trends, low cost or value, and highest quality. The respondents were able to rank these options based on their personal priority. We had 256 responses for this question and did a weighted conversion so we could compare these values side by side. This line graph shows us that low cost and convenience were neck and neck as the top priority for our shoppers with highest quality being 
the decline in priority from highest quality to latest trends was substantial. Accessibility was the least prioritized factor of the five. This is great data, but what I really wanted to understand was how these priorities changed based on our household income levels. If you will view the left side of the screen, you can see our different household income groups with the number of participants in each one. We had a nice spread of data and combined our upper level income groups making over $150,000 a year. We can once again see that latest trends and accessibility, which are orange and light blue, were the least prioritized factors. So let's focus in on the other factors which are more prioritized. Starting on the left side of the chart, we can see that the household income groups making less than $100,000 have a pattern. They all prioritize low costs as represented by the green more than any other factor, with convenience in red was prioritized second and highest quality in blue was prioritized third. However, those with a household income greater than $100,000 had different priorities. See, our respondents with a household income greater than $100,000 a year prioritized highest quality, which is the blue segment, just as much as low cost, if not more. Now those making between $125,000 to $149,000 a year prioritized highest quality more than anything else. So what are the major takeaways here? We've all heard the cliche saying, time is money. Our data is saying the same thing. Convenience is highly prioritized, but so is low cost and high quality. If you're a business that wants to reach a wide array of shoppers, all three of these need to be implemented into your business models. Our data shows that shoppers with a household income under $100,000 prioritize low cost and convenience the most. And shoppers making more than $100,000 are going to prioritize higher quality goods and services more than others. So if you own a business or work for a company that provides a good or service, are you reaching your target audience at their priorities? If not, what can you do to attract more people to your business? Thanks for your time. I'm going to pass it on to my teammate, Shane. Thank you, Essen. Hello, everyone. My name is Shane Connor. Do you as a listener think there are enough women and minority owned businesses? This is the question we ask consumers and what I wanted to learn more about. <clears throat> In our survey, we asked our respondents, do you feel there are enough women and minority owned businesses to support your needs? They could choose between the provided options, yes, no, or unsure. More than 200 people answered the survey. As you can see here, 26% of our respondents said yes, there are enough. 35% said no, and 39% said that they were unsure. Of those respondents that answered no or unsure, we then asked, for your needs, what top three areas do you face challenges in finding women and minority-owned businesses? There were 12 industries listed, which they could select from, as you see in the list here. We wanted to know which industries consumers believe were lacking in women and minority ownership and which were the most challenging to locate. From the 12 industries listed, you can see there was a wide variance in responses. Personal services like barbershops and nail salons were reported to be the businesses that were the least challenging to find. There are four though that stand out as being the most challenging to find, and they were selected by our respondents over 260 times. Those top four industries are technology, finance, home and utility, and construction services. Almost 17% of our respondents reported that technology-related services were the most challenging to find. In total, these four industries make up, up over 56% of all responses. Using the data we collected, we wanted to see where exactly these respondents who were seeking more women and minority-owned businesses were located at. Based off their provided postal code information, we were able to determine the location of each respondent that said technology, finance, home utility, and construction services were challenging to find. Here you can see a heat map that represents our survey responses, with the yellow representing the highest number of res responses based on their spatial data. Our next step was to identify if there were any women and minority owned businesses in these industries that we could locate and bring awareness to. As it turns out, working with our directory team, we located approximately 150 women and minority owned businesses that provide technology, financial services, home utility, and construction services in Alabama. Of these 150 businesses, 120 of them are located in the same area around Birmingham where our respondents said that they were challenging to find. 
In conclusion, we have learned that there are many people in the Birmingham area that are interested in supporting women and minority owned businesses. Black women and men and younger white women make up the greatest effort to support them. Don't forget to mention your business is locally owned. To reach a wide array of shoppers, you need to prioritize convenience, high quality, and value. But most importantly, our data shows that there are enough businesses to support the needs of consumers. But there's a disconnect between consumers and the businesses locating each other. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Robin Hunt will now introduce the business directory team and what they have discovered. You guessed it. I was muted. <laughs> Sorry. Just had to let it happen at least one more time. All right. So as my women and minority business directory team get prepared, just wanted to talk about this team has had their heads down in data and have faced some challenges that the other teams um, had maybe not encountered. In addition to using our survey to collect and identify businesses, they also had to compile data sets from multiple sources. And even compiling multiple data sets from multiple sources even had to then continue to clean and manually look up information to confirm that it was correct. So their focus has been a lot on data quality and I'm extremely proud of what they've been able to accomplish in the short amount of time that they've had. So I won't steal any of their thunder, but I just thought I might tell you that none of us want to look at another postal code for at least a week. We do not want to look through any more social channels for at least a week. And we're super happy with what we found together. So uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our team. Thank you, Robin. Our group had the pleasure of working on the Women and Minority Owned Business Directory. The goal was to create a comprehensive list of all women and minority owned businesses in and around the Birmingham area. After getting our survey data, our results were intriguing. My name is Adrian Jones and I am a data analytics candidate. I'll be taking you through an overview of what went into creating the women and minority owned business directory. According to BB Ham, in 2012, there were 48% of black owned businesses in Birmingham. This might seem shocking to some of you because some people might say there's not enough of minority businesses in Birmingham, but this doesn't tell the entire story. Of those 48% of businesses, they only accounted for 2% of gross revenue receipts. Think about that. My group wanted to find out why of such a low number of gross revenue receipts, we have such a healthy amount of Birmingham businesses that are black owned. And we wanted to take that a step further and look at women and minority businesses, not just black owned. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about where we got our data from. We used a collection of several sources, including Urban Impact, BB Ham, Blacklisted, and our survey data. We used tools that we learned in class, such as Power BI, and Power Query to combine them into one comprehensive list. And also, thanks to you, we were able to compile all of our survey data. We had over 72 respondents who are friends, allies, or patrons of businesses submit on behalf of owners. We then went and contacted the owners to get more information. On the next slide, I'll highlight the businesses that we found. We found a total of 644 women and minority owned businesses in and around the Birmingham area. Of those, 562 were minority owned, 162 were women owned, and five were veteran owned businesses. In order to stay consistent with Blacklisted and their data, when we created our combined list, we used their five categories to categorize all of our businesses. The five categories that we used were services, eat, drink and play, shop and venue. As you can see, service oriented businesses made up the majority of our women and minority owned businesses at 456. And we broke that down a little bit further. We wanted to see the subcategories and the types of businesses that were represented. The majority were 46 consulting, 37 clothing and apparel, 
37 contracting businesses, and 36 were dining and restaurant businesses. If you take a look at this map, you'll see where the women and minority-owned businesses are located that are identified on our list. Most of them are around the Birmingham area, as you can see. And if you'd like to locate this data and actually explore it a little bit more, please visit the social media pages of Think Data and Innovate Birmingham. And speaking of social media, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my teammate, Justin, to discuss his findings with women and minority-owned businesses and social media. Thanks, Adrian. And thanks again for everyone in attendance today. My name is Justin Jones. And I want to switch gears and talk about a subject that we all know, yet we all don't know the importance of social media. Most businesses are aware of social media exposure, but an abundance of businesses have not taken advantage of what I like to call free promotion. Given the circumstances of today, social media has become one of the world's biggest social, social platforms for not only socializing, but for businesses of all kinds. Facebook, Instagram, and even YouTube allows you to promote your business and even gives onlookers a piece of what your business is like from a video perspective and different social posts as well. Let's look at my visual. This shows a total of 644 respondents that responded to a website and a social media site for their business. I broke down the social sites to our top five sites by the number of our respondents. Is your business really taking advantage of the opportunity for endorsement through social media? My data shows that Facebook is by far the most used social site. But do those businesses know about the advantage given, not only during the pandemic times, but for as long as social media is relevant? My next two slides will show a breakdown of both women and minority-owned businesses with social media profiles. In the year of our Lord 2020, for numerous months. As businesses prepared for a complete shift in revenue, they also need a game plan to preserve their business assets. While jobs, interviews, school, and of course, social life goes virtual, businesses with a traditional approach to gaining customers and brand exposure begins to dent. I asked you for testimony from a customer, but you don't have a testimony because you don't have a platform for your customers to express themselves on. Now, let's talk about product exposure. Facebook and Instagram are some of my favorite social sites to not only, to not only purchase items, but sell and discuss a product as well. For companies without actual websites, social media is the absolute best platform to show your establishment and even give people a good feeling about your personality. Everything considered, having a social media profile would not only help your business promote events, products, and services, but it will also give your customer a platform to express their experience, but also allow more exposure for your company. After carefully mining for this data and plugging in missing key points that weren't inputted by as we could to obtain accurate data and learn visuals to explain. Thanks again for everyone. Now to my Thank you, Justin. My name is Maya Lee. Good afternoon. I will be talking about the brick and mortar locations versus online presence, as well as the year the business was founded. COVID-19 has shifted our world in a major way. Individuals are pushing for more and more online services. Production slowed down which forced businesses to either make harsh decisions or force close. I want to know how many businesses had brick and mortar location versus online presence and how they were using their platform to gain support during the pandemic. Out of these businesses, 14% of them were brick and mortar, as you can see in the orange. About 64% in the light blue had online services only which proved majority of the businesses were able to sustain during this pandemic. About 22% of the businesses had brick and mortar and online services. As well as Jordan said, Facebook seems to be the leading platform that businesses were able to network and also gain, gain support. 
our survey address this data by presenting allies and representatives different questions than the community. About 81% accounted for the friend and ally patron. 1% submitted as representatives of the business. 18 were owners and they, which was fascinating, not many people chose to answer this question, which kind of made our data a little bit difficult, but we end up finding more information. Although COVID-19 did promote business to shift, I want to see how the market advanced in the past 10 years with brick and mortar location and online services. Adrian mentioned in 2012, 48 businesses were, were black owned businesses or minority. Majority of these businesses were primarily brick and mortar locations or online services. We didn't really have a mix. In 2013, after that, it seems that the brick and mortar locations started to grow. But as more and more advancement come in with technology, this is going to soon damper down. In 2020, all businesses that were started were online services, which is not surprising due to the pandemic and also to technology advancements in our field. With our government forcing social distancing and mass ordinance, it's not surprising that more and more businesses are pushing for online services. You guys, this is our future and it's very important. Next, Brianna will be introducing us to barriers that we found with the business owners. Good afternoon. And again, my name is Brianna Palmer, and I'm just going to briefly discuss barriers to entry and general business barriers with respect to gender of the primary business owner. As of 2017, 39% of all privately held businesses in the US were owned by women, a segment that has experienced two times as much growth in recent years with owners in the Southern states leading those numbers. I mean, also as of 2017, those businesses contributed 8% of employment revenue and 4.2% of total revenue in the US. We chose to include a barrier component in our survey as we wanted to take a deeper look into the economic impact of women and minority owned businesses as growth and economic clout for these businesses go hand in hand with the overall state of economic growth. We chose these particular business barriers as seven of them are the most pervasive and inclusive based on data compiled by the United States Commission on Civil Rights, as well as one related to the mandatory components imposed by COVID-19. The total number of respondents who provided gender information by identity as either female, male, or gender diverse was 77. I mean, as you can see, the overall numbers show that female respondents overwhelmingly provided responses over their male and gender diverse peers. Um, we provided this section of the survey that was only available to respondents who identified as owners or authorized representatives of the business, and we posed this question to them as seen below. I chose to look at each individual gender and highlight differing challenging. This chart are organized by level of agreements to each barrier. And from the data, one can infer that both genders face significant challenges in obtaining necessary funding, while female gendered respondents being, were considered being provided access to necessary business networks and critical information, a significant barrier. And male gendered respondents face the largest challenge in gaining access to business education, as well as face difficulty in entering the skilled trades and obtaining licensing. Gender diverse individuals responded in such a low number that that data was negligible. I mean, now I will pass it on to Deborah, who will be discussing the business barriers by race. Thanks, Brianna. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deborah Bindian. I also chose to focus on the different business barriers, but instead broken down by race. I chose to focus on this because I wanted to see if these barriers affected minority businesses differently compared to their white counterparts, and if so, by how much. I began by constructing my visualizations on black and white businesses. I decided to leave out other races due to a lack of enough data to make an impactful analysis for these groups. First, I filtered by primary race of the business, 
This allowed me to be able to measure these business barriers and how they affected these groups differently. But these visuals didn't quite get the point across, so I broke the data down even more. For a deeper analysis, I decided to focus on the three barriers with the highest disparities across these two groups. Difficulty obtaining licensing, access to funding, and access to business education. I then filtered by agree to this being a barrier or disagree to this being a barrier. I'd like to begin by focusing on licensing. 28% of black business owners face difficulty obtaining licensing, while 0% of our white business owner respondents face that same issue. Next, 76% of black business owners felt that access to funding, investments, and financial loans was a barrier to their business, while only 30% of white business owners saw it as an issue. Finally, 44% of black business owners agreed that access to business education was a barrier, while only 33% of white business owners felt the same way. This has proven to be an interesting analysis of business barriers and has shown how much they affect races differently. But Brianna and, and I wanted to take this analysis further. Brianna and I will now discuss these barriers by gender and race combined. This analysis allowed us to gain even more insight into these barriers and exactly who they affected the most. We began by constructing a visualization for the women and minority owned businesses. This is broken down by their responses on whether it was a barrier to their business or not. It's interesting to see how certain barriers affect women and minority owned businesses more, but we wanted to go even further. Research has shown that discriminatory views such as racism or sexism have had a tremendous impact on the business and economic development of women and minority owned businesses. Based on this, we wanted to focus on access to funding, access to business networks, and critical information, and discriminatory views. Here, we have the three business barriers filtered by the race and gender of women and minority-owned businesses. Let's start with funding. 30% of white female-owned businesses reported access to funding as being a barrier, while around 76% of black female and male-owned businesses reported it as an issue. Next is access to business networks and critical information. The numbers were much closer across the board with around 50% of each group reporting this as a barrier. Lastly, at least 50% of each group reported discriminatory views as being a barrier, with black female owned businesses having the highest reporting at 65%. Interestingly enough, and possibly due to the fact that they are both female and a minority, their number was 11% higher than black male owned businesses. Um, so research has shown that discriminatory or prejudicial views such as racism and or sexism have a tremendous impact on the economic and business development of minority owned businesses, which account for 18% of all privately owned businesses in the US. These views overwhelmingly play a part in minority owners being denied access to funding and investments, as well as access to social capital, such as mentors or role models within their Effective business network. I mean, we hope that further analysis of these barriers is conducted as realizing the economic potential of women owned and minority owned businesses requires changes in policies, business practices, and attitudes. We hope that you all will continue to add to the, the women and minority owned business directory and look for ways to support our vast amount of respondents, as I'm sure they would definitely appreciate your business. I mean, this concludes today's data presentation, and we want to thank you for taking the time to listen to us. And I'll now pass it back to our instructor, Robin Hunt. Very good job, I'm so proud. I always cry on demo day, so I've had my video off just streaming over here. There's so much hard work that goes into this, and I want you to remember that when they came to us 14 weeks ago, none of them had touched Power BI. In every presentation you saw today, they were leveraging some of the top tools in the country for data analysis. I cannot be more proud of them. Turn it to the judges. <laughs> All right, done. Thanks, Robin. Uh, excellent job from our data teams there. I'm so surprised by all the new data that you added since I saw your draft a few days ago. It is just absolutely incredible. 
I think this data is going to be super valuable for our partners and our community. So I can't wait to see how it lives on. Judges, comments or questions, we'll have a few minutes for you to ask anything you'd like of the data teams. So this is Dr. Starks. Um, I have a question for the COVID-19 business impact um, group. So based on um, the fact that the, the data that you pulled was from midsummer, and in comparison to the data of um, you were using um, that was earlier in that year, how do you think the perceptions of COVID impacted business trends and um, what you were able to see in your analysis and what questions could you have used to capture some of those um, feelings that were different than what may have been earlier in um, this COVID space? I'm sorry, you said, you said business plans, is it? The COVID-19, what do you mean business plans? Plans, plans. But business trends. Trends, trends, I'm sorry, I miss, I misheard you. No problem. Um, I would think definitely the attitude around COVID has changed tremendously. There was extremely fast bipartisan um, action that this was a very dangerous pandemic back in March and they authorized an enormous amount of money quickly for it federally and locally and everything. And then from then there's been a lot of disagreement, you know, in the beginning of this epidemiologists were leading the way and then virologists had their say and now immunologists are saying there's, probably people have a lot of existing immunity, which wasn't believed to be the case, but they thought this was a novel virus back then. Now, now they're saying it appears people have T cells for this, things like that. So trends have been kind of all over the place. There's not really scientific consensus right now, but as far as- um, And I guess I mean more so around business trends, not necessarily- Yeah, I mean, business trends are reacting to that differently. You know, just, just here very, Colloquially, college football is very popular, and the Southeast Conference and the ACC have decided to go go ahead with their plans to play, while the Big Ten Conference and the Pac-12 Conference, two major athletic conferences, have decided to cancel their seasons. And so, generally speaking, in the Sun Belt areas in the Southeast, it hasn't been nearly as bad as it was in New York. So here, I don't, I don't think it's having quite the same impact that people thought it was going to have, but it certainly has been um, negative overall. But definitely also some of that is the reaction to what government did with these, these enormous programs. And I think I'd like to add to what Andrew said too. And in terms of businesses, um, I think that they're, they're scrambling at this point. They didn't realize that their businesses were going to be impacted for so long. And so what we found with our data is that they are taking every effort that they possibly can to make revenue and, and to make to make up that income that they're losing. Um, we asked a question about, um, I'm going to get my notes here, but we asked a question about how businesses shifted to other goods and services. They shifted their production. And it was an open-ended question. And we found the most interesting things about that. Um, we found out that obviously a lot of restaurants shifted to, type, to curbside type things. Um, there was a ride share drivers who used to deliver passengers, but now deliver food. Uh, a window treatment business now provides sneeze guards. Auto dealers are learning how to do body work so that they can take on insurance claims. And so people are really just ultimately doing whatever they can to make their businesses work in this time. So I hope that answers your question, Dr. Sark. I have a quick follow-up as well. So with the census survey, it was interesting because the Birmingham region, can y'all hear me? Um, the Birmingham region compared to the other metros across the country reported one of the, they were least likely to say that they had faced a large negative impact when you looked at the matrix of responses um, a few weeks back, right? So when you think about that methodology, the census use in addition to the timing, what do you think, I mean, the difference between that large net effect was very interesting to me. I think there's something else that might be there beyond just the timing. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Agree. And I, I'm sorry, I don't know what that was, but uh, I totally agree with you. I thought that was super interesting. And part of the reason why we think that is, is because our survey was anonymous as compared to uh, the Pulse survey. 
So I feel like that anonymity really helps people to be truly honest about the actual impact that it's having. And they can be also be honest about how they're feeling about the government and how they're feeling about how the government is handling uh, all of this. So that's the, only, that's the only other reason I could think of um, other than the timing. Thank you. Any other judge questions or comments for our data groups before we move on? I've got a couple comments on data and it kind of brings in, I'm gonna leave the um, statistics and the data to Dr. Starks and Emily. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the design element because that's where I always played with data developing consumer dashboards. And so um, all of your scripts are so good. The visualizations were amazing. Don't, um, don't discount the effect of a pop of one big number to tell the story of that dashboard. So sometimes a pie chart really isn't worth it. It's more just to kind of throw out that big impact number and then it'll tell the story of all the data sets around it. I thought you guys were really good with your colors. That can be um, mind blowing in the minute somebody looks at a dashboard and they struggle, uh, you've lost them. So color is very important. There's um, huge information there. I've often sent out a survey with open-ended questions and wish I could get a redo. And so what I started doing was taking a subset, sending it out with the open-ended questions and it gave me without kind of blowing the entire data set, it gave me the chance to, to correct that survey for what I was looking for. Um, and then also be careful just of backgrounds. Some of the backgrounds were, they were great, but just kind of take a step back, look at it and see, is it too distracting um, from the actual piece? But I thought you guys did an incredible job bringing your audience into it. It was super interesting, very engaging. Um, and so when I hire you guys, because I love data and I love everything that you guys did, um, those are just some of the things that we'll work through together and you'll consider. Don't forget to, to take, so you had some that had like six things because there were six categories. Just throw up to the top three and put the rest of it in an appendix. And if I'm super curious, I can go to that later. And I know y'all added those for our benefit, but it's just something to think on. So. Thank you. I actually have a, a follow-up question. I, I agree with Delphine. Great job for each of the um, presentations. I thought they were really great. Um, but for each of the teams, what was, with having to deal with such large data sets, what was your favorite thing that you got out of the presentation that you were doing? And what was one of the hardest things that you had to overcome when dealing with such large data sets? Let's start with a COVID group. We'll go in order. Okay, I can I can jump in from the COVID group if you'd like. Um, so, I think my, what's funny is my favorite part is also the hardest part um, because I love a challenge, right? So, um, when we included that pulse data, just reformatting that and having to unpivot our data to match their data, that was incredibly challenging. It came in to two totally different formats. And so implementing that and then having to put it in the same visual, man, that was tough. That was tough, but that's what I love about it is that it was so challenging. So um, that's my perspective. Uh, Andrew, do you have a favorite part? Um, I enjoyed that we wrote the survey almost entirely ourselves and we designed it in such a way earlier in the course we were showed how Survey Monkey works and and how it presents the data to you back into an Excel spreadsheet or CSV file. And we designed our survey in such a way that it was going to be easier for us to clean. And we noticed, you know, we had a lot of crosstalk between our peers. Their survey data cleaning process did not go as easily as ours. I would I would say so. And I mean that was exciting that it worked the way that we wanted it to work and that we could be into Power BI and making the dashboards interactive at a much earlier time. And, and that was, um, that was exciting for me that, that it worked as we designed. We, a lot of forward thinking went into this and um, it, it worked as, as we planned for the most part, there were some unforeseen things that came up, but for the most part, getting our design to work how we wanted it to from the start is, is something that I really 
really enjoyed. I think that's my favorite part. So let's hear from the spending team. Um, so I'll be, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, so for me, the fun part, um, I guess like Mary said, is also the hard part. But what ours was just digging into the data and kind of seeing what we would find. So just seeing like, ooh, this is that. And, you know, seeing if um, our assumptions were going to be correct. And then uh, last minute, I had a super last minute change of my data because I removed one thing. So having to um, fix that was a little bit of a challenge, but it was also a fun challenge and I got it done. So I'm pretty proud of myself. Um, and then also the hard part was keeping it simple because we found so much and we wanted to share so much with you guys um, and just trying to figure out how, what, what tells the story? Uh, Robin has drilled, <laughs> tell the story into my head, <laughs> and I probably dream about it from this point forward. So that was for me. And I'll add on that um, I kind of bounced around to all different groups. I was a little part here, a little part there, and then finally in the end, I joined the data group because that's just where I, or the, the spending group because that's where I ended up. But um, working in teams was really interesting. Was um, uh, just a, an interesting way to like, oh, I love that color. Tell me which color you used and, you know, pulling different parts and making it cohesive, working together in that way. It was hard and it was also really interesting getting to know each other um, better and, and, you know, learning to work together and, you know, taking criticism. Um, you know, that was good, but maybe it could be a little better. That was, that was, that was challenging as well. So um, that was both the good part and the hard part. And plus I had some major technical issues with my computer. So I relied on Robin and Taylor and my teammates to help me out as well. That probably wouldn't have happened if we had been in person, but you know, Power BI isn't, isn't made for the, the lay, lay person's computer, but uh, we, we worked through and we all worked in together as a team and got it all done. Awesome, so why don't we have a, Okay, sorry, go ahead, Emily. I was just going to add, you know, y'all were talking about how there was so much you wanted to, to tell us. And I think back to Delphine's point, a lot of the charts you showed were really great and powerful, but they're more of those ex exploratory charts, right, that you would kind of play around with. And I would have loved to have seen, just think about when you have that aha of you're like, this is interesting. And you said it, but I would have loved to have seen the visual match up with what you were saying. And then maybe think about using a headline instead of a title. So instead of asking the question, a quick statement about what your summary is there and what you want that key takeaway. But you were so close to it. I saw it a little bit throughout, um, but it's just a little bit of a step further. Um, but overall, just really a great job. And all of you were just such good presenters. And I think having that technical skill set and also being a good presenter is going to take you really far. Yeah. And I'll go Absolutely. on. Um, sorry, go ahead. I'll kind of jump in behind you, Adrian. Okay, I just wanted to kind of say what my most challenging part, I wouldn't say it was my least interesting because I actually enjoyed this. By far the most challenging was the data cleaning process, um, especially combining lists from different areas. Uh, so we had our survey data and I think it would have been pretty easy to clean that up and do what we needed to do with it. But when you're combining data from other sources, uh, you have to clean them, get them in the same format, get them in the same order. Um, and that takes some time, um, especially when, you know, you have people putting commas in places that they shouldn't and adding capitalized letters in different places. The capital T is not the same as lowercase t and that creates problems. So definitely spent a lot of um, long nights and after hours like doing the cleaning and helping out doing that. And our group were, uh, were just meeting and trying to really get the data to a, a good form to make connections to data sources, which I didn't even know that you could do. Um, so that part was definitely challenging, but I learned a lot during that process. And my favorite part was the storytelling part of, um, I think what so many businesses do, uh, I guess where a lot of businesses don't do well is they collect a lot of data, they get out, ask all these questions and they don't do anything with it, or they don't pull out the right insights. So what our group did was we sat back and we said, okay, what is the story that we actually want to tell? Because you can go in so many different directions with the data. Um, and I think that's what's really powerful. All right, we'll have Brianna go and then we'll move on to the software. Um, I can say for me, the most challenging part was again, just following up with what my other cohort members have been saying, was the data cleaning aspect. Um, consistent data changes 
we would have multiple updates by day, sometimes multiple within the day. So changing and reconnecting and all of that was, I say, the most challenging part, but it was the most rewarding aspect because I think we created something really, really great. Um, and I think for me, the most exciting part was being able to do research and connecting how our data was matching up with national research from much larger people who do this on a regular basis, like the Small Business Association and the National Association of Women Business Owners and U.S. World Report, and to see that our data is consistent with what they see in trends as well was remarkable for me. Absolutely. Uh, if, I, if I could say very quickly, I echo all of uh, the judge's excellent work. This is very valuable to the partners because of the questions that we will further explore. Um, I think there's a lot uh, to talk about in terms of correlative analysis, everything from uh, education and PPP towards social media. I think that in econ, we always strive for the money chart, the money graph, and the money graph for me was the beautiful overlay of minority-owned businesses and the heat map of people who, was ask, who are asking for that. So my quick question to maybe the third group in the team or second or third group is how would what would you say going forward to the partners, um, particularly the city ourselves, you know, Hika, how do how do we need to standardize this data and this repository going forward so that we can keep it perpetual and usable? Because uh, that is why this data falls apart. Is that no one wants to? I mean, we're at 600, 600 plus you know, we can identify hundreds of more within months and, you know, over a thousand, you know, who wants to do that? So having that methodology, what would be just some of your key insights and techniques that you would recommend to us as a collective? So I'm going to jump in on behalf of all of our teams too, because again, this is all of this data is so interesting. We have a lot of thoughts and feedback for you um, and our partner groups who want to discuss what do we do with this living source of data. Uh, one thing these teams have done has they have compiled it and cleaned it so that we could take it and push it wherever it needs to go and create a database structure that could be something easy to work with. So I would say that's a really big question with a really long response. So out of respect for our coding group coming up, don't worry, Elijah, I'll be blowing your phone up to discuss where do we go next with the 600 plus businesses. I will say the last thing before I hand it off um, to either Haley or Josh is um, that they have cleaned it in such a way that our ability to hand it to you for the minority and the blacklisted site should be just a matter of minutes to publish. They've worked very, very hard, so. We'll leave it at that and we'll turn it over to coding for respect for their time as well. I really appreciate all your feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robin. And thank you to our judges. That was excellent feedback and questions. And I'm very excited for those continued conversations on getting that data to you. And hopefully you have a great crop of talent that you can hire to help you work with that data moving forward. All right, Josh, I will pass it to you to introduce our software development groups. Great, thanks, Haley. Um, so over the past few months, the web development class have devoted themselves to this lifestyle change. Um, at Innovate Birmingham, we not only teach valuable skills, but by showing our classes how to teach themselves new skills, um, we're preparing these people for the rest of their careers. Um, to cohort 11, I'm proud of all of you. I hope that you all take this knowledge that you've gained in the class and use it to better your life and make the world a better place. Um, on top of that, I would like to commend all the Innovate Birmingham staff for doing a great job this cohort. Um, and I'd also like to thank our curriculum partner, Covalence, for their hard work as well. Um, so with that out of the way, uh, we're going to get right into the presentations. Um, our first group's uh, project is called Helping Hands, and I'm going to pass it off to Quinn Wardy to tell you more about it. Quinn? Yeah, thank you, Josh. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today to hear about all our ideas. I um, just want to pose a question to start off with. Uh, throughout our COVID-19 experience, has there been a time where you wanted to support a local charity but did not know how? Well, we have a solution for you. I'm very excited to tell you about our site called Helping Hands. It's like a library that you can use to find any reputable Alabama charity. And we believe now more than ever, charities need to be highlighted so that people can help each other in these trying times. Our website was made using an existing third-party API called Charity Navigator that catalogs charity information across the whole nation. 
And for those of you who don't know, an API is a software-to-software -software interface that enables two applications to exchange data among each other. Now, using Charity Navigator's API, we were able to gather data relevant to Alabama charities. We then integrated the information from the API into our own database. This allowed us to focus on a specific set of data to add to our website. Um, our, this was a very convenient way of transferring the information because when that API is updated and we update our database, our site automatically updates its content without us having to manually enter the data. This makes it so our site can scale very easily. Now I'd like to introduce our team members. My name is Quinn Wardy. I worked on the back end of our site with integrating the data from Charity Navigator's API to our MySQL database using Node and Express, as well as implementing the filtering functionality for the front end in React. Hi, I'm Maggie Thompson. I also worked on the back end consolidating data from our database onto our website, as well as managing changes to our GitHub repository. Hi, I'm Chaston Harper. I worked primarily on the front end elements of our website, including its basic framework and styling. I accomplished this primarily using CSS and Bootstrap. Uh, my goal with the styling was to create a design that was visually appealing, but also simple with a consistent color scheme throughout. Shishandra, you might be muted. Oh, I got it, Quinn. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I am Shashandra Collins. I helped my team with organization and edits on the front end. Hey, I'm Harrison Allender. I assisted with the front end development and also curated the content for the about page and the home page. The home page was designed to give the user a sense of direction when it comes to uh, helping local charities. It is the first thing a user will see when coming to our site, so we wanted to give the user information to help on their first steps. Since there is no one way to help, we inform the user to seek out the charity that they would like to support and contact the charity to figure out a game plan. As you can see, we have included a COVID section uh, to inform users how to help charities safely. We have also included links to local websites that will further assist users to learn about how to help uh, the local community during the pandemic. Our website was designed to have a seamless flow between the user and the information that we have provided. Even from our home screen, you have the option to use the search bar to find a specific charity to go to the charity's detail page. Let's see how it works. I would like to look up the Never Thirst charity to demonstrate the search bar. You also have the option of seeing a full list of charities in our charity tab. I will now pass it over to Quinn so he can demonstrate the charity page. Thanks, uh, Harrison. Uh, so moving on, our charities page lists all reputable Alabama charities. And on the left side here, we have our charity directory that will sort our charities by whichever category you would like to see. And at the top here, we also have a search bar that you can use to search for the charity of your choice. You will notice that the directory dynamically changes as we type in the search bar. Now, when the API adds a new charity in Alabama, it'll automatically be added here with all of its information when you click on it. So moving on, let's click on one of these individual charities to see more, and I'll pass it on to Maggie to tell you more about that. Thank you, Quinn. When you click on a charity card, you are taken to a details page for that specific organization. This page includes the organization's mission, contact info, and rating, as well as two buttons that link directly to the organization's website. More info provides users with up-to-date information directly from the charity's website. We also have a donate button, which takes the user to the charity's donate page so they can take the appropriate steps to support the charity of their choice. Now, Chastin will provide some final thoughts. And finally, we have the about page here, which gives a brief summary of what we hope to accomplish with Helping Hands. Essentially, our goal for the site was to, to provide a convenient location for people to access reputable Alabama charities and to learn more about them and donate if they choose to. Um, since there is no one way to give back, Helping Hands hopefully makes it more convenient for people to give back to their communities in their own way. Um, and with that, our presentation is concluded. If you'd like to learn more about Helping Hands, please feel free to reach out to the team members that you see here. And uh, thank you for your time. Great job, guys. So our second team's project is called Applied Movement. I'm going to pass it over to Hafiza Shahid to tell you more about it. Hafiza? Good afternoon. 
We are a software development group, and together we have created a web application for orthotics and prosthetics practitioners titled Applied Movement. We are super excited to showcase Applied Movement, but first, I'd love for you all to meet my team. I'm Hafiza Shahid, and I collaborated with Derek Strong on the front end. I assisted in the styling of the page using Bootstrap and CSS. We also utilized JavaScript, React, and React hooks in the creation of the necessary functions components and routes required to allow interactivity and functionality to our web app. Next up is Brian. Hi, my name is Brian McMillan. I help Jerry Upton build the database, which stores our the information for our CRUD operations. For our application, we use MySQL and MySQL Workbench as well. Hi, I'm Cameron Seeley, and I work with Aaron on the back end. I also help connect the third-party API mailer. Up next is Derek. Good afternoon, and thank you again for joining us. I'm Derek Strong, and I work with Hafiza on front-end development. We utilize Figma in order to build our wireframe, Trello for project management, and use HTML, custom CSS, JavaScript, React, Bootstrap, as well as other development tools in order to build and style our application. I also work with our back-end team to connect our third-party API, SendGrid, to our contact form using Node.js and Express. Up next, we have Aaron. Hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Dial. I worked on the back end development of Applied Movement alongside Cameron Seeley. We utilized ExpressJS and Node.js to connect the front end to the back end. We also used Postman's to test our CRUD operations for functionality. Again, my name is Aaron Dial, and now I'm going to pass it along to Jared. Hey, my name is Jared Upton. I developed the database with Brian. McMillan using MySQL and MySQL Workbench, as well as perform the data mining for the project. My team decided to create this app based on my personal experience as an orthotics and prosthetics patient, otherwise known as o &P. For the past nine years, I've noticed many inefficiencies in the collection of patient information at smaller o &P clinics. I noticed the administrative clerk has to meet with the doctor after each patient in order to notate by hand why the patient came in for a visit. To streamline this timely process, with our app, the doctor would be able to use a tablet with the patient to document the visit, and this, and this information would be directly submitted to the administrative clerk. In this observation, Applied Movement was born. Now, I'll pass this back to Hafiza. Thank you, Jared. To bring it all together, we created an app to simplify the OMP patient documentation process, and we believe it will forever change the way these clinics operate. Here's how it works. The homepage holds some interesting facts and features for visitors regarding the OMP field. Scroll down, and the page also displays a contact us form, which will allow users and visitors alike to submit an, an email to our address, appliedmovement2020 at gmail.com via SendGrid. The email function utilizes Syngrid's API in order to collect and respond to the submitted messages with a comment. Scrolling back to the nav bar will get us to the magic of our web app. The login modal allows for secure access to the patient information form. After logging in, here the doctor enters the patient's identifying information in the respective fields. The checkboxes allow for the doctor to quickly select the patient's reason for visiting the clinic and their concerns. The doctor can then select their assessment of the patient's issue and create a plan to address their concerns. At the end of the form, we've added a field to address any additional medical notation regarding any situation that may have occurred during the patient's visit. At the top of the page is a summary of the doctor's selections. After reviewing the summary, the doctor can submit the form. After submitting this form, the doctor is sent to their patient's records database. Here, the cards will display the doctor's prior created submissions and allow for the retrieval of a patient's information by use of a search bar where the patient can be located by name. One click on a specific card and a detailed record will show documentation regarding the patient's visit. The patient records page also allows the doctor or administrative professional to edit or delete a patient's record. In closing, we believe the features of this app will allow for the physician and patient to enjoy a better experience in their respective OMP offices. 
It will give clinicians the opportunity to fast track the collection of patient documentation and better facilitate their records keeping processes. This concludes our presentation. However, we will be happy to answer any questions you may have at the end of the web development program. Thank you for your time and for tuning in to our demonstration. Great job, Applied Movement. Um, I'm a prosthetic user myself, so I know me and Jared are, we know that that's a necessity. Um, so our next team's project is called Fruit Divi. I'm gonna pass it over to Haley Keith to tell you more about it. Haley. Thank you, Josh. I'm gonna wait on Charles to get this pulled up. Good afternoon. We are Fruit Divi and we have created a person-to-person -person food sharing website. We were inspired by LA-based nonprofit, LA Fruit Share, and they are hosting socially distant monthly farmers markets in their own community. Before we introduce the importance and the features of our website, I'd like for my teammates to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Brittany Lewis, and I worked on the front end with creating a home page, login page, and styling presentation utilizing Bootstrap and custom CSS. Hi, my name is Charles Welsh, and I worked on both the wireframe design using Adobe Illustrator, website architecture with draw.io, custom CSS styling, managing the master branch of our Git repository, functionality of the front-end signup forms, as well as the front-end and back-end Google Maps API integration. Hi, everyone. My name is Isaac, and I focus most of my time on the styling of the pages using Bootstrap and custom CSS, as well as preparing the site for our mobile platform. Hi, my name is Sydney Williams, and I worked under the hood connecting our React front end to our ExpressJS back end, the construction and integration of our MySQL database, as well as password encryption using vCrypt. Hello, my name is Haley Keith, and I work on the MySQL database, as well as the authentication strategies using Passport middleware and integrating those strategies from the Re React front end to the Express back end. Feeding America forecasts that by the end of 2020, that 20% of Alabamians could be facing food insecurity. What's more disturbing is that one third of those newly hungry won't qualify for food assistance programs such as SNAP because they'll have earned too much. We already know that 1.9 billion meals have been distributed from community food banks from every county across the country. Yet food waste still remains largely unaddressed. There is cause for hope as a paradigm shift is occurring within our communities and that's sharing. And this is where Fruit Divi comes in. Fruit Divi is the place where people can come together to share in backyard bounty. Visitors will create a secure profile on our website by clicking on the button that applies to them. Get food or give food. Users can also create a profile by utilizing our navigation tool at the top right of the page from anywhere on the site. We have two registration forms for both a provider and a collector. And now over to Sydney. Thank you, Haley. A food collector can be anyone. It can be an individual seeking to close their food gap or an organization collecting food on their behalf. Note, the only requirements to sign up as a collector are a name, email address, and password. This information is stored securely in our database and is encrypted. Returning users can utilize our sleek and secure login page. A food provider can also be anyone, a work from home gardener with spare berries or a local produce distributor with fresh overstock. For now, we will register a new food provider. The registration requires five simple things, a name, We'll use Innovate Birmingham, an email address, info at innovatebham.com, password, we're not telling, local address, 1500 First Avenue North, Birmingham, Alabama, 35203. And of course, we can't forget the fruit. Innovate Birmingham has delicious pineapples and blackberries, so we'll use those. Again, this information is stored securely in our database. Once registered or logged in, the user will be redirected to their account page 
where they can access valuable fruit DV resources. Charles will tell you more. Thanks, Sydney. Here we have our map. This was created using a Node.js module that integrates the Google Maps API into React. The addresses in it on the provider form is passed into our backend in a standard format and then obfuscated into latitude and longitude coordinates with a little bit of server-side magic. When entered into the database, this ensures that provider personal information is secured. Our map then dynamically populates with markers based on those coordinates stored on each provider profile. Each marker here opens up a card which shows the name of the person providing as well as a list of the fruits or produce that they have. And here at the bottom, you see a link to open in Google Maps. Let's take a look. We have here a couple of providers, uh, regional produce distributors listed. We have the profile that we created and a couple of other users that have already signed up to give. All right, so let's take a look at the Google Maps implement implementation. You'll notice once the page loads here, um, we're being redirected to Google in a new tab. And this panel over here uh, populates with the provided coordinates for the address. Here, the user will be able to just uh, click on directions and they will be directed to wherever they want to go on uh, Google's behalf. I will pass it on over to Isaac. Thanks, Charles. And if you don't mind, would you display our mobile platform so that they could better display that for them? Fruit Divi is where social responsibility and sustainability meet. This user-friendly platform makes it easier for all communities to come together and satisfy the longing for humankind unification. After all, we're on this organic spaceship together, and I believe crop and nutrition for all should always be a staple topic of discussion. And I don't know about you all, but starving is definitely not on my list of things to do for the day, and I don't think it should be on anyone else's. Send us off, Bree. We are Fruit Divi. We will connect those who have to those who need. This concludes our presentation. Okay, great job, guys. So our final team's project is called Under the Hood. I'm going to pass it over to Anna Prado to introduce their app. Anna? Give me them just a moment. There we go. Hi everyone, we are a group um, team under the hood and uh, basically our project is a website to help you learn and keep track of your car maintenance needs. Um, my name is Anna Prado and I work on managing our team's schedule and tasks, influencing UI design and the user and work on the front end code for the project. My name is Adrian Arambula. I worked on the front end development and the maintenance page functionality. My name is Brianna Fout. I worked on the front end, design, and the navigation of the website. Hi, I'm Jessica. I worked on the DIY section of the website, utilizing React Player and Bootstrap to style and render videos. And I'm Will Kirkpatrick. I primarily worked on the back end and the database for this website. Uh, back to you, Anna. Thank you so much, Will. Um, so we're super excited to show you our project modeling what we have focused on to be using everyday daily use. Um, our project model will be very helpful for those who may need some help maintaining their vehicles on a day to day basis. It offers a maintenance page detailing past maintenance dates and a detailed video list of all of the uh, do it yourself maintenance where you can find simple solutions for daily use and submitting an engine code in the diagnostics trouble code that we also offer. It's also a really great time um, to take advantage of this website at the moment due to our recent pandemic with COVID-19. Um, if someone may not want to go out and go to a nearby mechanic shop, they can basically go to this project and search up any questions they may have and it could be handled by using this website. So we're going to head over to the login page. We've already registered our user and we're going to just type in their information. Um, we're using the Passport and JSON web token for standard authorization protocols to encrypt user data. And now Brianna is going to go over our home page. Thank you, Anna. This is the home page. So this is the first page the user sees once they're logged in. Our mission statement is also included on this page. From here, the user can navigate throughout the website by either clicking the profile picture icon or by utilizing the menu button. Next, we will navigate to the dashboard warning light page. 
These lights that appear on the dashboard of a user's car indicate an issue with the car. Here, users will be able to understand the meaning behind each of these warning lights. I will now be passing it along to Jessica with DIY. Thanks, Brianna. I worked on the DIY section, um, and it is curated with instructional videos aimed to help clients find instructions for performing general maintenance on their vehicles. Next will be Will discussing symptom diagnostics and profile. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, if you ever have trouble with your check engine light, our app has a handy tool for diagnosing those issues. All you need is the fault code to put in right here. And once you hit submit, it will fetch uh, information from CarMD's uh, maintenance database. It will give you a description of the issue, the urgency of the issue, the difficulty for completing that problem, and the approximate number of hours to complete the problem as well. Lastly, it will give you the parts needed and the approximate price of those parts as well. We also store all the user's vehicle information on their profile. Here you can see uh, all vehicles that are associated with a particular user's profile, and you can add as many vehicles as you want to that profile. All you need is the VIN number. You click new vehicle and input it right here. Click add vehicle and it will add another vehicle to your page. You may also update the mileage on your vehicles whenever you want, just to ensure that they have the most up-to-date and accurate maintenance information as possible. Next off, I will be passing it over to Adrian to talk about the maintenance page. Thank you, Will. As you can see here, we have the user's information displayed along with the picture of their vehicle. And just under that, we have the maintenance features. Here, you can input the dates of your last maintenance for each of the parts. Each of the jobs require a different estimated time to be done, such as you wouldn't need something as your battery to be changed as often as your oil. We also can store all the da user's data of the previous jobs in our database to ensure the customers can always come back to our website after years to come with his or her information saved. Under the hood is a great website for all your DIY auto maintenance needs, tells you exactly what you need, pricing for it, how difficult it may be, and tells you when you need it done. So stop looking at the ugly check engine light and start checking out what's under the hood. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great job, guys. Um, so small correction, folks, I apologize. We now have our last team. Uh, their project is called Rona Radar, and I'm gonna hand it over to Alandis to tell you more about their project. Alandis? Hello, everyone. Welcome to our website, Rona Radar. First, I would like to welcome my team and, uh, and tell you our roles at this website. My name is Alandis Seals, and I was part of the symptom page. My name is Justin Brooks, and I helped with the conceptual design of the project and worked on the front end using Bootstrap and CSS for styling. Also, with the help of Ruin, we manipulated data from a third-party coronavirus API. Uh, hey, my name is Rowan Douglas. Uh, I worked on the front end uh, and back end, mostly on the home page and state page. Hello, my name is Jaden Vance. I worked more on the front end, making the news page and implementing one of our mini APIs. And my name is Christian Collins. I helped work with their GitHub repository as well as the database. I'll move it over to Alandis to start our introduction. Welcome to the new norm. You are probably lost to find information that have been accustomed of COVID. Look no farther. Using APIs to run the statistics and recent news, my team and I are about to make your new normal feel a lot safer. Here we have our homepage. As you can see, we have a map of the states, which is color coded ranging from a light tan to a deep red color based on the number of new cases per day in the United States. To the right of the map, we have information provided by third party APIs displaying statistics on the total number of confirmed cases, the total number of people that have recovered from the virus, and the total number of people that have unfortunately lost their lives due to COVID-19 complications. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Roland to give you details on our states page. All right, and then, and then we have the state page, uh, which displays the name of the state that was clicked, the state image and its infection color, the last updated time for the data, all of the stats for the current state like daily infected, daily deaths and total tested, and two graphs that show new cases and deaths over the most recent 30 day period. 
All the information used to create the graphs and the daily totals was sourced from the COVID Tracking Project API. It collects information from 50 U.S. states, the District of Columbia, and five other U.S. territories to provide the most comprehensive testing data. Now I'm going to pass it to Christian. Hello, everyone. I'm Christian Collins. I helped work with a lot of the GitHub repository and databasing stuff, but I would like to take this moment to talk about the Rona Radar itself. Uh, its primary goal is to help educate, inform, and redirect. And with the help of my partners and I, we, I hope we are able to accomplish that. From here, I'm going to move it on to my partner, Jaden Vance, to talk about our news page. All right, so this is the news page. By integrating the news API, I'm able to show you a list of articles that relate to COVID-19. So on the news page, I've set it to display recent articles to help, you, to help inform you more in the coronavirus. Using the API, the news page pulls data to refresh the list of articles every day to give you a current, up-to-date information on COVID-19. Now going to pass it on to Alandis to talk about our symptoms page. You muted, muted. Alandis. Welcome to the symptom page. This page tell you all about COVID symptoms. We also added a short video to tell you about how to prevent this virus. If you are worried about how to find testing sites in your area, with the click of a button, you, you'll find near you testing sites. This map takes your current location, find, uh, find testing site, information about the testing site, and direction where you have it. This concludes our website. We hope you stay safe, have a good day, and remain healthy. Good job, guys. Okay, now that concludes our presentations. Uh, I'm going to pass it back over to Haley and our judges. Excellent. Thank you to our web dev teams. Really great products that y'all have built from scratch in addition to your technical skills. Also uh, coming up with a business idea, which is an added, added thing that you've put on your plate. So thank you. Um, if we have a few judge quick comments and questions, and then we'll dismiss y'all to the room to select a top group in each class and we'll move on. Judges? Yeah, I, actually, actually I do. So um, you know, this is Michael from Google. So, um, first of all, for throwing these all together, is, especially as quickly as y'all did, um, that's pretty tremendous. Um, I, I want to applaud your use of, of open source technologies. I think that's fantastic, right? You're using, uh, I think you're all, you're all using MySQL as an open SQL or as a, uh, as an open source uh, relational database. I think that's, that's, that's awesome. Obviously very easy to scale out into multiple businesses. So good on you for that. The use of APIs. Um, you know, I, I guess as, as far as a question for y'all, um, so that I can be brief, uh, I can see so many different directions that, you know, additional features and things can, can, you know, can kind of tack on to each of these solutions. I'm curious if, if each one of the teams has a, a vision for where, you know, like one thing that you could pick that you could see as an enhancement to your current um, site that you could kind of see, yep, you know, we really want to tackle that part next because we feel like it's going to add X value or something. I'm just, I'm, I'm curious what, uh, what, what technical aspect you might, you might add to it. Um, I can speak for Applied Movement. Um, one of the things we want to add to our site is uh, add new feature for each one of the um, items that a doctor can click on for like different or, or additional um, options they need in order to be specific to a patient. Right now we have a limited number of things that we can click on, but we do want to actually add an add new feature that will actually scale up that site um, and the application for the doctor as they grow and they have different patients come in. I'd, I'd like to speak for Rona Radar. Um, I think that adding a profile page, um, you know, in the register and working on the login, uh, would really help because when getting your current location, if you're doing it from a computer, it uses your IP address and it doesn't really um, get as specific as where you really are. Um, but if we had a, a profile page, I, I would put their address in there and that way we could reference that in order to get a much like closer uh, starting destination for them. Uh, I can uh, take this for Fruit Divi. Um, I think that we would also like to uh, add uh, provider profile uh, information that would allow people to update produce as they have during uh, what type of harvest season they might be in. 
uh, as well as um, updating when the produce might be gone uh, or they have some new, new items. And uh, I'll take uh, this one for helping hands. Um, I believe that our, we have a future feature that would add a login um, capability so that users can comment on specific charity pages, um, especially nowadays with social media uh, you know, being as important as it is, uh, being able to have a discussion about specific charities and what, what their needs might uh, be at that specific time could definitely help uh, those specific charities. So have, having a login and, and comment capabilities would be great. And for under the hood, one thing we really want to add is information about recalls for your car so that under the hood will keep you up to date on any recall information that has happened or will does happen in the future for your car. Awesome. Yeah, I just, I, I was curious to see because I saw so many of those things kind of coming out. And, and so, you know, that, that, that those all sound great. The, the, the one parting comment I would make for, for everybody is just uh, make sure, and again, I know there's there's evolutions and things coming from this, but as you evolve them and you keep moving along with them, be very aware of the data that you're using. Um, you know, if you're using PHI, right, healthcare data, um, there are stringent rules and regulations around how that is consumed, disseminated, um, if it is breached, what you're supposed to do, um, you know, things like that. Obviously, with news, if you're tracking news, uh, very cautious about how, you know, what information is being uh, displayed and uh, curated. Uh, with parts, like you said, actually, you kind of mentioned one um, from under the hood in terms of recalls, right, is obviously a very important action when you're, when you're tracking that kind of data. And then for, uh, for Fruit Divi, um, you know, we've seen a, a lot of uh, organizations like a Chipotle, for example, where uh, some people have gotten sick from food and you want to make sure and kind of be ready to track those kinds of things. So, you know, it, it may not all fall on your shores, but be aware of the risk of the data that you're using um, as you continue to evolve this and just have a plan for how you react to that or modify it or enhance it or do kinds of things like that. So just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you so much, Michael. Any other judges have a comment or question before we break? Hey, Dr. Sarks? Um, I wanted to say kudos to um, each of the ideas in developing um, a system and a platform um, for those different businesses to be developed. And it's very reminiscent of the work that we do with Stream Innovations and students being able to create websites at the end. So my heart um, was really happy to see um, more people being able to come together with cool ideas so that you can develop systems that people can use in order to be more beneficial to you know a global society so um i'm excited and um, this is going to be hard for us because <laughs> these were really good so kudos to all of you guys i would agree with dr starks i think save the chat because this is your market research if you want to launch any of these products um a few just quick notes from a technical perspective on Fruit Divi, you had some really good call to action buttons, but I could not see them as well. So just make sure when you have those CTA buttons that you can see them and make your buttons really visible. Um, again, and this is where some partnerships with the data, data analytics folks may come in, but data quality is really important and just understanding where the data is coming from and like Michael mentioned, the security around it. Um, and then real quick, Quick for Fruit Divi on the MySQL database, it, what is the field format on that? Is that a drop down, a pre select fields, or is that an open text? Anybody on that? I'll take that. The field is open text. Okay. Did you, um, do you anticipate any issues with filtering or for? Um, or being able to search that data because of that? And if, would you make any adjustments to that moving forward if, if you could make an enhancement? Yes, we would make adjustments to the database just depending on um, the information that is provided. Obviously, we want to restrict to only fruit being added to the table, so we would implement drop down boxes in the future. Great. Thank you. I'm going to quickly piggyback off of Emily. Just in the future, um, I don't know how much y'all did and we're going to be quick, but how much considered accessibility issues about the size of the buttons and also the colors for any color blindness and just making sure that that was taken into account. Excellent feedback. Thank you to all of our judges. 
Now you will uh, have your time to deliberate and select winners from each class. So I believe Haley Hoppy has shared with you instructions to join your deliberation room. So you can do that now. And I will pass it off to Diva to take us through the break. Thanks, Haley. Hey, everyone. My name is Diva DDS, and I'm the marketing strategist at Innovate Birmingham. So while the judges deliberate winners for each class, we have put together a compilation video of our program. So without further ado, let me go and share that with you all. My name is Morgan Bell, and I'm the Workforce Program Specialist for Central 6 Alabama Works. I help plan and facilitate programs in the Birmingham area to assist current and future job seekers in their search for a quality career. Central 6 Alabama Works is the Regional Workforce Council for Chilton, Shelby, Jefferson, Walker, St. Clair, and Blount Counties. We host quarterly meetings with industry cluster partners to identify their workforce challenges and training needs. Central Six partnered with Innovate Birmingham in 2018 to co-host the Birmingham Tech Council and increase our engagement with local IT employers. In response to employer demand, Central Six developed the first federally registered consortium style software development apprenticeship program in Alabama. The apprenticeship model is relatively new to the IT industry, but has been successful for decades in industries like construction and manufacturing. Apprenticeships allow employers to create training programs that fit their needs uniquely by including both related instruction as well as on-the-job training at their facility. These programs improve productivity and reduce turnover as it trains apprentices in nationally recognized competencies and upskills employees in the work processes specific to an employer. Apprentices will receive progressive wages as their skill set increases and receive a national certificate of apprenticeship at the completion of their program, which is transferable to anywhere in the U.S. As a result, apprenticeship programs benefit both the employer and the apprentice alike by growing talent and increasing a person's quality of life. The Innovate Birmingham Software Development Bootcamp serves as a pre-apprenticeship providing participants with the fundamental skills to succeed in the apprenticeship program. Our recruitment cycle aligns directly with the bootcamp, 
so we're able to run three recruitment cycles a year as long as there is employer interest. We launched this program almost a year ago and we currently have five employer partners at Sagayo Studios, Protective Life, Kesis, Shipped, and UAB. These employers have a total of seven apprentices currently completing the program. Once an apprentice is hired by an employer partner, the apprenticeship will take approximately 15 months to complete. Apprentices are required to complete a set number of hours in specific competencies, which are outlined in the Appendix A. You can learn more about the Appendix A on the Central Six website or by talking to me directly. If you'd like to learn more about federally registered apprenticeships as a whole, you can visit the DOL's website at www.dol.gov backslash apprenticeship. If you are interested in participating as an employer partner for the Central Six IT Apprenticeship, I'm more than happy to meet with you and discuss additional details. We believe that the more employers we have participate will improve the effectiveness and sustainability of this program. Please reach out to me through email at mbell at central6.org if you're interested. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this, and I hope to hear from you soon. My name is Miles Douglas. I am 24. I am from Birmingham, Alabama. Um, coming out of high school, I had initially went to a welding course, uh, but the reason why I ended up not sticking with that, I had an allergic reaction and it ended my ability to continue the course. And so I ended up having to go back to the drawing board to reanalyze what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I tried many jobs. And for a point, I felt like that a job was just a means of a paycheck. But once I got to Innovate Birmingham, it completely changed my perspective of what a job really could be and what it was meant to be. The tools that I received here at Innovate Birmingham were, for one, the comfort in being able to go out and speak in front of a group of people. It's often very difficult to get out in front of a thousand people or even 10 people and really tell them what you found or what's on your mind or your opinion against something when you know that there are often rebuttals coming. Uh, I also learned the ability to better, better analyze and clean data information, spreadsheets. All these things were new tools to me coming into the program. I learned how to better communicate and work with groups of people from all walks of life that I, without this program, I probably never would have had that experience. So without a doubt, I have received of more than essential tools to my future and me getting employed. What initially made me consider Innovate Birmingham was a very close friend of mine who I ended up seeing on television who was sponsoring the program, the data program here at Innovate. And just through seeing a familiar face made me feel just that much more comfortable to take the leap forward to try to get my resume information in to get, the, uh, get into the program. Once I got the opportunity inside of the program, I didn't look back. I did everything I saw possible to accomplish what I set out to accomplish, which was to get the Microsoft certification and to get a job within at least three to five months, which I was able to accomplish as of, I want to say a month ago, which I was able to land a position as the guys. Yeah, they're not studio. So what I can honestly say how Innovate Birmingham impacted me is they impacted my life through the most positive way possible. I cannot honestly say that I would be in the position that I am in today as a market specialist a year ago, coming off of a job that really wasn't for me and our, our, our cultures did not align together. And so just experiencing that and then having the opportunity to go and start over and create something new of my own hands for myself is just a monumental experience. If 
you want somewhere where your talents can be nurtured, cultivated, and brought to their fullest fruition, innovate is the place for you. It is just the culture, the people, the way that they go about handling their students and the techniques that they implement are just superior in, in just about every area. And that is me speaking in complete honesty. So that was our video. Hope you guys enjoyed that. And also in the last slide, if you are a company or if you know a company who would love to hire some of our candidates, our graduates, contact our director of engagement, Haley Hoppy, and also follow us on social media to stay up to date with us. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Haley Kay. Thanks, Diva. Thanks for preparing that excellent video for our break time. I believe we're still uh, waiting on judges to return. So I wanted to give an opportunity for the web dev class to address some of the questions that have come in in the chat. I believe Chris asked a question about the scalability of your databases and you've been providing some text responses, but I wanted to let open the floor and let you respond uh, if you'd like to while we have the time. Anyone? Yeah, I think actually uh, from what Jessica Latin, Latin, uh, Latin said, uh, another thing that we could, that we would probably have to fix when scaling our database is that we're using the Google Maps API and it costs money. So we would have to figure out what we we're gonna do. <laughs> Anyone else like to? respond i don't know necessarily other than you know we integrated the google maps api also um, but as far as the database goes we're not storing anything other than latitude and longitude coordinates and a basic name and a list of fruits so <laughs> i i'm not sure um, i'd be worried about any sort of security there or scaling Great, thank you. If anyone else has any questions for our teams, you can drop that in the chat too and we'll try to use this time to allow some response to that and try to share my screen. You've made the judge's job too challenging by all being so excellent, so. I will take some of this time to share about Innovate Birmingham as an overview for folks who have not
had the opportunity to get to know us a little better. But all of our employers on the call will know that IT talent is a hard thing to find and that's not unique for Birmingham. Here in Birmingham, we have about five times as many tech jobs posted than people here to fill them and graduating out of our two and four year programs with degrees in computer science. And that's not expected to slow down over the next uh, four, I guess six years, it's 2020, with that's expected to grow 20% each year. So just like every other city in the country, Birmingham must find another solution to meet this tech talent need that we have in the region. And we believe that Innovate Birmingham is part of that solution along with many of our partners who are working to do this work of connecting our local talent here with the skills to meet that demand. This is a quote from our board chair, Ben Pogbielski, that every city has a tech talent shortage, but that city's response is what makes them stand out and Innovate Birmingham is part of that solution that sets Birmingham apart. What we strive for at Innovate Birmingham is to create an equitable economic community and prosperity across our tech ecosystem. And we do that in a couple different ways. What you may not see from the presentations here today are all the different pieces that go in to making this possible. Really at the heart and foundationally to everything we do is employer demand. They are not largely represented on this panel today, but our employer partners of over 30 employers in the region are fundamental to the work that we've done by providing us feedback on what their tech talent needs are, what the employability skills that they need are, how our curriculum is meeting that demand, how our students are performing once they enter the job, and that drives every decision that we make as an organization and what programs we provide. Once we have identified those needs from employers, we work to constantly get feedback to tweak curriculum and improve it based on need. And as you saw in the video shared before, we're able to create the first IT apprenticeship in the region led by our partner at Central Six to provide that additional step after a boot camp for a software developer to continue to hone their skills and get into the uh, nitty gritty of being a developer on the job and continue to earn throughout that process. What is, we, I don't think we've mentioned in this time that we've had together so far, these students that have completed these last 14 weeks have made a monumental commitment by engaging in full-time training. Uh, our class expectations are Monday through Friday, nine to five for 14 weeks. So that is at least a full-time job worth of commitment that they have all put in and many, many more times outside of that normal day's work and digging back in, reviewing, studying, and working on their projects. And we recognize that that is not a light commitment and therefore have had the opportunity through our partners and our funders to provide additional support outside of the technical training based on need for our students in the program. And that looks like supportive services and case management, professional development activities, and engagement with employer partners, which has evolved quite a bit in the virtual environment, but we are working to try to connect as many opportunities like that as possible. And finally, our alignment with our community partners that are in addition to our employer partners. So others in our region that are working with workforce development programs or economic development programs to provide different pathways and on ramps into these careers and training opportunities so that together across all of our partnerships, we're able to offer a full menu of training and education opportunities based on where someone may find themselves in that process. And again, get back to meeting that talent demand for our region. Over the last it's four, three and a half years is how long we've been operating. We have served over 700 students and really built out that pool of tech talent here in the region between boot camp and scholarship graduates. We have trained folks in IT help desk and uh, computer support, data analytics, software development, many of which you've seen today, but also digital marketing, project management, and traditional uh, degree programs at the associates and bachelor's degree level in computer science, electrical engineering, 
management information systems and digital forensics. I believe our judges are joining us back here in a moment, which is perfect timing. We're back. All right, I thought I heard you come in. Haley, I'll pass it to you. All right, let me make sure, let me get all the judges in here, make sure they're all back. Um, can, let's see, we've got Delphine, Elijah, Emily. Didn't see Michael. It looks like Michael's stuck in attendees. Diva, can you promote him to a panelist? Ah, okay, so he can hear it. Okay, all right. So for the data analytics class, we have group two, the consumer spending group. Congratulations. Congratulations. Spending group, excellent job. Yay. And for web dev, fruit divvy. Congratulations, Fruit Divi. Yay! We should unmute and clap so everybody can hear yeah. all of our claps. Round of applause. I like claps are weird. Thank you. <laughs> it was a hard choice for all of them. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you so much. Everybody did a great job. Excellent. Excellent job to all the groups. Thank you again so much to our judges who have had a very difficult job to select the best of all of these excellent presentations. And to our cohort 11, you have really taken on a, a difficult challenge in a unique time where we are uh, not only making the leap of starting and investing in a new career path, but also weathering that amidst a really unusual time that is very unpredictable and adds on a whole new layer of learning virtually and learning at home and all of the challenges that come with that. And so I want to recognize just all of the complexity that you have dealt with and not only completed and gotten through, but really excelled at. I know, I think I say it every class, because every time I'm more and more impressed that this is the most impressive group of presentations that I have seen. And I'm so proud of the work that y'all have done. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how that evolves and the data moves forward for the data groups that worked with partners and potentially some of these projects and apps becoming startups or things in the community that people can use. So congratulations, you are now officially graduates of Innovate Birmingham, and we encourage and hope that you are not strangers, that we will one day be able to see you in person, uh, who knows when that will be, but that we in, cannot wait to celebrate with you when that time comes and welcome you to the community of tech professionals in Birmingham and the whole community of Innovate Birmingham graduates. So congratulations. Thank you for all that you have shared with us and taught us along this challenging time that we have also been learning how to deliver this program virtually. And I cannot wait to see what you do next. Congratulations. Thank you for everyone for joining us and we will see you soon. Thank you.